All right, so cycle three, okay? Um, we are going to talk about osteoxes with cycle. So uh, this past three cycles, we've been in phylum chondrixes, or sorry, phylum chordata. Um, and then we've been looking at three different classes of fish so far. We looked at agnatha, which is your jawless fish, right? And then you have chondrixes, which is the cartilaginous fish, which we talked about last cycle. And then this cycle, we have osteoxes, which are bony fish, okay? So osteoxes, oste means bone, ixes is fish. So these are the bony fish. And then one of the characteristics that they have to have in order to be placed into this class is they have to have a bone skeleton, okay? So they must have a bone skeleton. That bone skeleton is going to be lighter than a cartilage skeleton, which is good for buoyancy, and it's also stronger, right? It's going to be harder to cut through the skull of a of like your yellow perch that you will dissect rather than like your shark, okay? So. Um, okay, um, so they have bone skeletons. They also have flexible fins. So uh, remember your shark, when you dissected your shark, you, their fins were stiff, right? And when you do your yellow perch, you'll see that they just have, they have bones, and they actually have joints in those bones that allow for those fins to be very flexible, okay? Um, and then they just have a membrane in between each of those bones that allow for them to have their little fins. So their, their fins are much more flexible, they're much thinner, and depending on what environment they live in, what habitat they live in, what they need them for, they will be different sizes and shapes as well, okay? Um, they're also only gonna have one gill slit with a bone cover over that gill slit. So that bone cover is called the operculum, um, and that operculum is going to cover the gills and protect the gills from things that try and get into the gills and harm the gills, like parasites um, and other things like that, okay, predators. They also are going to have a swim bladder that they're going to use for buoyancy. We'll talk more about that. Um, and then they also are going to be at all different levels of the food chain, depending on what they eat. So they can be predators, they can be scavengers, they can be herbivores, they could um, be involved in mutualistic relationships like the cleaner fish, they could be involved in parasitic relationships, it just depends. Okay, buoyancy regulation, they have a swim bladder, okay? A swim bladder is an air-filled sac inside of their body, okay? So it is like, how many of you have ever been in a pool and you've had like a, a ball, right? Have you ever had like a big blow-up ball and then you've like kind of like rested on the ball and like stayed up at the surface of the water, okay? Yes. Um, have you, how many of you have done that? Yes? Okay. Uh, they essentially have that just inside of their body. Okay, and that's known as their swim bladder. Okay. Um, that swim bladder is going to help to offset the density of their body. Okay, and help them to float. They can adjust the amount of gas that is in that swim bladder in order to change the depth of, that they're at. So they can add gas to it or take gas out of it, depending on what they're doing, um, so that they can change depths in the water. And um, how they actually do that is a little bit counterintuitive. Because when they descend, so when they go down deeper in the water, they actually add gas to their swim bladder. Okay? And if you think about it, it doesn't make sense. Right? Like, if you wanted to go down in the water, you wouldn't add gas to your swim bladder because if you add gas, it's like blowing up the balloon, right? What what would happen if you blew up that balloon? So you would float, right? So it doesn't make sense. Like, why would they do that? Well, um, what they, they do that for a very specific reason. Um, and the reason is because as they go down in the water, pressure increases, right? Water is heavy. So as it's, that water is pushing on that fish and on that swim bladder, um, ga the gas that's in that swim bladder gets compressed by the pressure, um, and by adding gas into that swim bladder, it prevents that swim bladder from just like collapsing in on itself. Okay, so it allows for there to be enough gas in there to um, keep it inflated even underneath the pressure. Does that make sense? Yeah? Okay. And then when they come up, so when they rise, they actually release gas out of that swim bladder. Because as they rise, the pressure decreases, the gas expands, and as the gas expands, 
Um, if they didn't let some of it out, it could expand too far and actually kill the fish. Does that make sense? Okay. So they actually do the opposite of what you would think. So they add gas to go down and take gas out to come up. Okay. The way that they actually change the amount of gas that's in their swim bladder, so there's two different ways. Um, they have, they can either gulp air or spit it out, um, or they can have a gas gland, this thing called a gas gland. Um, so if they gulp air, they're actually going to have like a connection between their stomach and their swim bladder. So I'm going to scroll down and then I'll come back up if you need the notes. Okay. So um, here's my little fish. Okay. The black is the swim bladder. Okay. This is like its mouth, esophagus, and then stomach. Okay. And the red. Um, if they are going to gulp air, okay, they're going to have a little connection in between their stomach and their swim bladder. So you'll see fish, they'll actually go up to the surface and they take a little gulp of air and then they go back down. Um, what they do is they swallow that air, it goes into their stomach, and then they can use that little valve to put gas into their swim bladder, okay, through their stomach. Okay. If they need to get rid of it, it works both ways. Okay, gas can come out of there into their stomach and then they spit it out. So that's why one of the reasons why if you look at a fish, if they like spit bubbles, that's that might be one of the things that they're doing. Okay, spitting some of that gas out of their swim bladder. The other way that they can change the amount of gas in their swim bladder is with a gas gland. So that's the little green dot right there. Basically, it's um, capillary blood vessels that are on a, a small part of the swim bladder. Um, and as the blood runs through there, if they need to add gas to the swim bladder, they can take like carbon dioxide or oxygen, the gases that are dissolved in the blood, out of the blood and put it into their swim bladder. And then if they need to get rid of it, they can dissolve gases from the swim bladder into the blood. Blood will circulate to the gills and then can be released from the gills. Does that make sense? Okay. So um, they've got two ways that they can adjust the amount of gas that's in their swim bladder. So either diffuse it out of the blood or they'll gulp the air, spit it out. I'll talk more about this, but active swimmers, really, really active fish, predatory fish like tuna and stuff like that, actually don't have swim bladders for some good reasons. So if you're still thinking like, okay, so that's great. They add gas to their swim bladder, uh, but they're still like blowing up their swim bladder. How do they descend, right? They're still like blowing up that balloon. How do they go down? Uh, well, here's how. So if this is our little fish's swim bladder um, in the red right here, they actually have muscles that surround that swim bladder. Okay, so when they need to descend, they'll add gas to that swim bladder and then they'll take the muscles that are surrounding that swim bladder and they'll contract the muscles of the swim bladder. And when they contract it, okay, it makes the, the gas compressed, right? And makes the fish's body more dense because it's removed some of that space. Um, and that fish can descend while still adding gas to the swim bladder. Does that make sense? Okay. If they need to rise, okay, they can get rid of some of that gas, relax those muscles, let that swim bladder um, expand, and then they can rise up to the surface. Yeah? Does that make sense? You're going to have to compare and contrast this like whole buoyancy regulation thing with bony fish with chondrichthyes or cartilaginous fish. So make sure that you understand it. Right? Let's move on. Okay, so fish have swim bladders. How many of you have ever been deep sea fishing? Anybody? Anybody? Deep sea fishing? How many of you have ever caught a fish and then like pulled it up to the surface and you get it up to the surface and it's got this thing like hanging out of its mouth, right? It looks kind of nasty. Anybody? Okay. Um, what's happened, okay, in that case, what's happened is uh, that fish has a swim bladder, okay? And when you hooked it and you brought it up to the surface, you brought it up faster than it could adjust the amount of gas that's in its swim bladder, okay? Yeah, kind of like the bends, but opposite a little bit. Like, because the swim bladder goes from being like, you know, this big, and you bring it up too fast, and so it expands oh, too rapidly. And so what it does, it doesn't necessarily, it, well, it can pop the swim bladder, but um, what it ends up doing is it expands so fast that it actually pushes the stomach of the fish out of the fish's mouth. 
um, and the intestines out the other end mm -hmm. and um, kills the fish. Oh, no, at that point it's going to be dead. Uh, yeah, you can release it to become food for sharks, but um, it's not going to it's not going to survive. Okay, so you can't just catch and release it. Um, that's why. So this picture is here to show you that. Okay, that's also why like we have a hard time studying a lot of the fish that live down deeper in the water because it's hard to bring them up to the surface because this happens. Okay. Um, if you slowly reel it back up, they might have time to adjust, but it also depends on the depth that it came from because some fish actually have uh, enzymatic adaptations, so their enzymes are different, um, and they actually work better under pressure than they do at the surface pressures, so they wouldn't, it wouldn't survive even then. The way that we try to do this is like we'll put them in like pressurized boxes in the water and then bring them up, but it's hard and expensive, so it's hard to study them. Okay, so fish, some fish will not have swim bladders. Uh, some fish won't have swim bladders, okay, because they're going to be predators, uh, like this big bluefin tuna. Um, and the bluefin tuna are eating lots of different kinds of things. So they're actually going to be like going down deep in the water and then coming up to the surface very rapidly in order to capture their prey. So they can't have a swim bladder because there would be no way for them to adjust the amount of gas in there fast enough, so they don't have one. That also means, because they don't have one, that they have to keep swimming their entire life or they would sink. Okay? So tuna, very, very active fish, they swim for their entire lives. They, these type of fish actually have to um, swim in order to breathe as well. It's called ram ventilation. So they have to be swimming in order to breathe. Um, and they don't have swim bladders. So, and if they do keep swimming for their entire life, they're going to have some special adaptations that allow for them to do that, like being very streamlined, like having um, little grooves in their body wall in order to, like, when they put their fins up, they can put their fins up and it's, like, flush to the body to reduce drag. No big protruding eyes, okay, no scales, that sort of thing. Okay, so here's our specimen spotlight on the lionfish, okay? I know, it's our class mascot. It's awesome. Um, it's in the scorpion fish family. Um, so there's a bunch of different kinds of fish that kind of look like this guy and um, are like striped like this guy and they're all poisonous. So the lionfish is a poisonous fish. If you get stung by it, you probably won't die, but it'll hurt and it'll swell and it'll take months to heal because the venom prevents it from healing. Um, it apparently hurts really bad. I've never been stung by one. It's going to eat, it's a predator, so it eats like fish and shrimp and stuff. Where it, it lives for five to ten years, but it's also it's typically indigenous to uh, the Indo Pacific, so around like Australia and all of Indonesia. But it's actually an invasive species in a lot of Caribbean reefs because um, people had them in their tanks because they're kind of pretty to look at, but they eat other fish. And so instead of like just what they did to get rid of them was they went and tossed them in the ocean. And um, lionfish reproduce very fast. They're very good predators, and they don't get eaten by much because they're poisonous. And so they have actually like taken over Caribbean reef ecosystems and have like destroyed some reefs. It's pretty bad. So um, they're an invasive species. Okay, scales. So scales of bony fish are called cycloid scales. There's also another type of scale called tenoid scale um, that will look just like the cycloid scales, but it'll have some like protrusions on one side. Uh, these scales are made out of bone, okay, and they're on the outside of the body. They're arranged in an overlapping pattern, so like you would have like tiles on a roof or something like that. That's how you would have the scales on a fish. Um, and then over the scales, they have a layer of skin and then also mucus, okay? And that mucus is why like fish are so slippery. Like if you try to hold a fish, it's very, very slippery. Um, that mucus also helps to protect them from like bacteria and stuff like that. Uh, so when you touch a fish, you actually wipe off some of that mucus and you expose them to bacteria and stuff and they can get sick. Um, and what's really cool about these is you can actually count the rings okay, on the scales in order to um, tell how old the fish is. Hmm? Yeah, same thing with creeks. 
Yep, just like a tree trunk. Okay. Their senses. Okay, their senses. They have really good vision. Okay, and their vision is going to be the sense that they rely on the most in order to hunt. Um, they do have a good sense of smell as well, but it's not going to be get as good as sharks. And um, it's going to not be what they rely on in order to find prey. They're going to rely on vision. Uh, their lateral line system, we talked about that uh, with the shark, and you also saw it in the shark video that you watched. That's like the sense of distant touch. Okay, so uh, fish have that as well. That they can sense things that are happening outside of their bodies away from them in the water. And then they also have good hearing. Their ears are internal. Um, they actually have almost as good of hearing as we do. Okay, so they can hear all, uh, pretty much in the same range as we can. We'll talk more about this. So all of these senses, all of that stuff is interpreted by the brain okay, of the fish. So a fish does have a brain. And then it's got a spinal cord and nerves and stuff in order to send signals back and forth to the fish's body. Okay. Olfaction is the sense of smell. Their nose is a little bit different from ours. So their nose are, is simply like two pits on the front of their face. So when you do your shark di or, sorry, fish dissection, you'll see um, you'll have like the two eyes and you'll see there's like two little pits on the front of the face of the fish. Um, and they're literally just like little pits. And then inside of there, they'll have like little sensory cells. Okay. And those little sensory cells, as the fish swims through the water, the water comes into those little pits. And any sort of chemicals and stuff that are in the water gets picked up by those sensory cells and sends a signal to the brain of the fish, and they can smell that way. It's different from you because your nose actually connects to your respiratory system, right? Theirs does not. They're just two little pits in the front of their face. If you look at the fish and those olfactory pits are large, that tells you that they actually rely more on their sense of smell. So the larger their nose, the better they can smell. Taste and hearing, um, like I said, their ears, they are internal and they have almost as good of hearing as we do. So we can hear between 20 and 20,000 hertz. They can hear between 200 and 13,000 hertz. So almost as good as us. Um, they do have a lateral line system. And then their taste. So they do have taste receptors on their tongue and they do have a tongue. You'll see it in your fish on Friday. And so they've got taste receptors on their tongue, but they also have taste receptors like on their lips and like even on their jaw, okay? Even like, um, how many of you know what a catfish look, looks like? The little things that hang off its face? Okay, those little things that hang off its face are called barbells, and those little things have taste receptors on them. So those little catfish, or big catfish, can move around and actually like use those little barbells to taste in the ground to help find their prey. So they can taste things before it ever gets into their mouth, which is kind of weird. Strange. So they have um, lots of taste receptors. Here's the lateral line system. Um, the lateral line system runs around the head and then down the side of the fish's body. And it's literally a canal that is open to the surrounding seawater, and it's full of seawater. Okay, so uh, this whole canal right here in red, Okay, so there will be little pores in here that open up to the seawater, and seawater can flow through the pores into this canal and back out the pores. Okay, so it's full of seawater. So if a fish moves over here, okay, it'll create pressure waves that move through the water, okay, and will enter in through the pores of the lateral line system, and then move through the canal that's inside here. And then inside of that little canal, there's little sensory cells, and as those pressure waves hit those sensory, cell, sensory cells, sends a signal through a nerve to the brain, and the fish senses what's around it, which is kind of cool. That's really, really important for schooling fish. You know what a school of fish is? Like a big group of fish, yeah? Um, so that lateral line system tells like the fish that are swimming next to each other when this one moves where it's going and, and what motion to follow. Okay, If they didn't have that sense, uh, they'd like be running into each other and it'd be just a disaster. Okay, so that lateral line system helps them to not run into each other. Their vision, okay, their vision. They do have good vision. 
but their eyes are going to be different from ours. So they do not have eyelids. They don't blink like we do. They also um, don't adjust their pupil size. So you know what your pupil of your eye is? Yeah the, yeah, the thing that goes like that or like the black dot in the middle of your eye, right? So when you go outside, okay, and it's nice and sunny outside, your pupil contracts, right? It gets really small um, because it's bright outside and you don't want all that light coming into your eye because then you wouldn't be able to see very well, so your pupil gets smaller to help you be able to see, okay? When you walk into a dark room, your pupil gets large to allow lots of light in to help you to see, okay? Uh, fish don't have that, so their pupils don't change size because they don't need it. They live in water, light gets filtered out a lot in the water, and so they don't need to adjust that pupil size because the quality of light is not that good. Does that make sense? So they don't adjust their pupil size. The way that they focus their eyes is also different. So when you focus your eyes, your lens okay, actually changes shape. So you have muscles that change the shape of your lens that focus the image on the back on your retina. Uh, their eyes, they actually take that lens and they move it back and forth in order to focus. So if you're into photography, you know, like the big pictures and then like how you twist the thing and it moves that back and forth in order to focus the camera, that's what a fish's eye is doing. It's like taking that lens and it's moving it back and forth to focus the image. Really cool about fish's eyes is they actually have what's called monocular vision, which means they have two eyes and each of those eyes sees a different picture. Okay, so you have two eyes, you see one picture, they have two eyes, they see two pictures. So if you watch a fish, they'll actually move their eyes separately and they'll actually be looking at two different things at once. It's strange. It's weird for us to try and envision because we don't even have a concept of what that would be like, right? I mean, yeah, you can cover one eye, but it's not like you're still seeing one picture, right? It's not like two pictures, two separate pictures. You can't like look up and look down at the same time, whereas fish can do that. So there's, you, you can't, no matter how hard you try, you can't, okay? So, bit of monocular vision, that's pretty cool. All right. Here's your internal organs. We'll talk more about this when you do your dissection. Okay, osmoregulation, and then we'll um, be done. Osmoregulation. So, we talked about osmoregulation with sharks. We skipped a part. We'll come back to it. We'll come back to it. Um, osmoregulation. So that's maintaining a salt water balance with the surrounding seawater, right? And when we talked about sharks, we said sharks maintain an equal to or greater than uh, concentration with the surrounding seawater. Um, Osteichthyes does this differently. So they actually maintain a blood salt concentration that is about a third of the surrounding seawater. So they maintain a concentration that is less than the surrounding seawater. So if you have more salt outside of your body, what's gonna tend to happen to the water? Yeah, it's gonna leave, right? So fish tend to get dehydrated, right? Bony fish do. Um, so what they do to compensate for that is they drink seawater. Okay. If you are on a boat in the middle of the ocean, you're stranded, and you're out of fresh water, and you see, oh, I'm in the ocean, there's lots of water for me to drink, so you drink some seawater, yeah, you're gonna die. Seawater actually dehydrates you faster if you were to drink it, uh, because you are not a fish fish have special adaptations that allow for them to drink that seawater, retain the water, get rid of the salt, and therefore not get dehydrated from the salt water. Okay, so they'll drink that seawater, and then how they get rid of the excess salt is in their gills. They have chloride cells in their gills. So as the salt and the salt water gets absorbed and the salts get into the bloodstream, the, these chloride cells in the gills spit out any excess salt back into the water, okay? So they'll spit out those salts, um, and that's where most of them get exit out of the fish's body, but they also have the kid kidneys that are really, really good at filtering out salt, um, and then they're just gonna produce a small amount of urine. So when you pee, you lose water, right? They don't wanna lose water, they already lose a lot of water. So when they pee, they actually only do like a little bit of liquid and lots and lots of salt. Okay, so it's very, very concentrated urine. Um, and then their intestines also help to filter out some of that salt. And you have this picture in your notes, right? So gills help to get rid of salt, the kidneys help to get rid of salt, intestines help to get rid of salt, and they drink seawater. Make sense? 
Okay.